Hello everyone, it's Dr. Lockley here, and I'm coming to you with Module 11. This is on page 727 of your Pearson Volume 1 book, and today we're going to be talking about the concept of intracranial regulation. So let's get started. Here are your learning outcomes. Uh, what is the physiology of intracranial regulation? What are the alterations in intracranial regulation? Outline the relationship between intracranial regulation and other concepts. So what other concepts are involved in this uh, concept? <clears throat> Explain the promotion of healthy intracranial regulation. Differentiate common assessment procedures and tests used to examine intracranial regulation. Analyze independent interventions nurses can implement for patients with alterations in intracranial regulation. So we're going to look at what uh, interventions, what we need to do with these type of patients. Summarize the collaborative theory, therapies that the interdisciplinary team uses and differentiate considerations related to the assessment and care of patients with this particular concept. <clears throat> Intracranial regulation refers to the processes that affect intracranial compensation and adaptive neurologic function. So in other words, it is that balance uh, within side of our brain, inside of our head, what is balancing that pressure. The neurologic system regulates and integrates all body functions, muscle movements, senses, mental abilities, and emotions. So we know that if the brain is not functioning correctly, we can have changes in mental status, our emotions, our senses, our ability to move, breathe, and even live. It collects as sensory input information from the internal and external environments, processes and interprets the input, and causes responses that manifest as motor or sensory output. So everything that comes through the brain uh, is processed and it tells us how our body should uh, function. So when these processes are not working correctly, we have dysfunction in our body. Uh, we may not be able to think clearly. We may not be able to move or breathe. Our heart may not beat. Uh, many things are affected by this uh, intracranial regulation. <clears throat> So what is normal intracranial regulation? The neurologic system can be divided into two parts, the central nervous system, and that contains the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which is made up of the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. The somatic component of the peripheral nervous system allows voluntary activities to occur, but the autonomic component of the PNS it controls involuntary activities that are usually required to maintain life, such as breathing and heart rate. The basal cell of the nervous system, of course, is the neuron. Neurons are highly specialized cells that send electrical impulses throughout the body. The information relayed by these impulses can travel in only one direction. If the transmission is to the brain, then the information is transmitted through the sensory neurons. But in contrast, when the brain transmits the information, it does so via motor neurons. Now we have this particular piece called the myelin sheath, and you can see a picture of it on the slide here. So it's the, the piece that covers many of the larger diameter and long nerves and helps speed the rate of conduction of nerve impulses. Although myelin is present in both central nervous system and peripheral nervous system, it's more commonly seen with the PNS. The myelin sheath surrounds the larger diameter and longer nerve fibers throughout the PNS, and the gaps in the sheath are referred to as nodes of Ranvier, as electrical signals travel from the brain through the neurons to specific parts of the body these impulses jump from one node of Ranvier to the next. So this helps speed the signals along, and it's very rapid. You know that, say, you burn your finger, and you eat, like, time you touch it, that, that 
neurons already fired. It's like it's like lightning speed. So what is the central nervous system? It consists of the brain and the spinal cord. The brain is the control center of the nervous system. It regulates it regulates homeostasis within the body, controls basic functions such as breathing, problem solving, judgment, memories, emotions, regulates more functions that allow life to continue and define who each individual is as a person. So the brain does a lot of things. We cannot live if our brain is not functioning. The brain is a sensitive organ covered by a protective coating of three connected tissue membranes known as meninges. They protect and nourish the central nervous system. The meninges for, from the outermost layer inward are the dura matter, the arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. In addition to being covered by the meninges, the brain is protected by the bony structure of the skull. So our skull, of course, our brain's in the skull, and if we hit our head, our brain can shift and cause damage. Um, if we have a fracture to the skull, it can cause major damage to the brain. So that skull, even though it protects, it can be damaged uh, by a hard blow or an injury or, or so forth, and that can be very detrimental. In addition to being covered by the meninges, the brain is protected by the skull and cushioned by cerebrospinal fluid that lies in the serachnoid space between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. The cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, cushions the brain and spinal cord and helps prevent injury to these tissues. So if you do have an injury, this fluid's going to help uh, ward off the initial shock. It would be worse if we didn't have the fluid. The central nervous system also contains myelin producing cells called oligodendrites that allow for efficient transfer of electrical impulses between the neurons of the brain and the spinal cord. A specialized group of epithelial cells that are connected by tight junctions line the capillary beds of the brain. These endothelial cells form the blood-brain barrier. This barrier helps protect the central nervous system by preventing potential neurotoxins from passing out of the bloodstream into the brain, such as like major viruses and bacteria. Um, however, important nutrients that the brain needs to function, such as glucose, amino acids, they can cross the blood-brain barrier via active transport. In a similar fashion, water and oxygen can cross via passive diffusion. You should have had those terms in NUR 112. The blood-brain barrier becomes more permeable during times of inflammation or swelling, sometimes permitting viruses and bacteria to pass through. When infections of the central nervous system do occur, the barrier also makes them more difficult to treat because of because it prevents most antibiotics from permeating or getting through. In some cases, the only way to deliver antibiotics to the CNS may be by directly injecting them into the CNS. The brain consists of four parts, the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the diencephalon, and the brainstem. So let's look at those. So, here are your four parts, the um, cerebrum, frontal lobe, speech, thought, learning, emotion, parietal lobe, processes sensory information, occipital lobe, it's your vision, and the temporal lobe stores memory and interprets auditory stimuli. So what are the parts of the cerebellum? <clears throat> the cerebellum is the largest part of the brain. It's in two hemispheres, account for most of the brain's mass. It is composed of an outer cortex of gray matter, an inner core of myelinated nerve fibers, white matter, and two hemispheres that are divided into four regions known as lobes. The frontal lobe is involved with speech, thought, learning, emotion, and voluntary movement. The prefrontal cortex of the frontal lobe controls more complicated cognitive processes such as judgment, 
reasoning, and concern for others, so certain emotions. The parietal lobe processes sensory information such as shapes, temperature, pain, and two-point discrimination. The occipital lobe, where the visual cortex is located, processes vision, and the temporal lobe stores memory and interprets auditory stimuli. The cerebrum does, does not have a flat surface, but rather a highly convoluted surface composed of sulci or sulci, which are grooves, and uh, gyri or gyri, which are ridges. This folding of the brain increases the amount of cerebral material that can fit into the skull. So what is the next part? And that is the diencephalon. It consists of the thalamus, sometimes called the dorsal thalamus, hypothalamus, epithalamus, and subthalamus. The thalamus is the brain's relay center. It takes all incoming nerve impulses and sends those signals to correct the region of the brain. The most important role of the hypothalamus is to link the endocrine system to the nervous system via the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus is the autonomic control center and it is involved in regulating heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, depth, pain, pleasure, and fear. So it's very important because if there's damage, then our heart may stop. The hypothalamus also controls body temperature, food and water intake and balance, sleep cycles, and digestive motility. The epithalamus connects the limbic system, which controls emotions and forms memories to other parts of the brain. It contains the the pineal gland, which secretes melatonin, a hormone that controls circadian rhythms or helps us sleep. The subthalamus is the part of the diencephalon that integrates the basal ganglia, which are responsible for motor movement. And I'm going to go back and pick up the uh, cerebellum. I don't think I had a slide for that. So let's talk about that here. And that's on page 729 with the rest of these before I move on to the brainstem. Uh, the next largest part of the brain besides the cerebrum is the cerebellum. The cerebellum is made of gray and white matter and is responsible for controlling muscle movement and balance. The cerebellum coordinates stimuli from the cerebral cortex and the spinal cord. It transmits information required for skeletal muscle contraction and smooth movements. The surface of the cerebellum is covered with thin parallel grooves folded similar to an accordion. The extra surface area gained through this folding allows more neurons to increase signaling processing capabilities. So now to the brain stem. <clears throat> it's made up of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. A lot of people like to say that word. The brain stem controls reflexes and influences all basic life functions, breathing, blood pressure, heart rate. The brain stem also regulates activities such as vomiting, hiccuping, coughing, and sneezing. 10 of the 12 parts of the cranial nerves originate in the brain stem. The brain stem is where many connection between sensory and motor pathways that link the brain and the rest of the body reside. Some important pathways include the spinothalamic tract, crude touch, temperature, pain, and itch, the corticospinal tract, motor functions, and the posterior column, medial lemniscus pathway proprioception, fine touch, and the sensation of vibration. So as you can see, uh, uh, the brain itself does pretty much everything. It tells the body what to do. Everything is controlled. It's the control center, like a computer. The brain stem also contains the reticular formation. This network of ascending nerves relays information to the cerebral cortex about alertness, and arousal mechanisms and directs the brain's attention to sensory events. 
This modulation of sleep-wake transition is known as the reticular activating system or the RAS system. The spinal cord is an extension of this brain stem, uh, specifically the medulla oblongata through the foramen magnum at the base of the skull. So if you get a fracture in your C1, 2, or 3 in your cervical, you could sever your brain stem. It's very dangerous to get a fracture there. In adults, the spinal cord is 40 to 50 centimeters long and one to one and a half centimeters in diameter. It contains both gray and white matter. Like the brain, the spinal cord is protected by the meninges and the uh, cerebrospinal fluid. The bony structure of the vertebrae also provides protection for the spinal cord, which ends at approximately L3 in infants and L1 to L2 in adults. <clears throat> The spinal cord transmits impulses to and from the brain. The ventral roots of the spinal cord carry motor or efferent nerve fibers, whereas the dorsal roots carry sensory or afferent nerve fibers. Now, the peripheral nervous system, it contains 12 pairs of cranial nerves and 31 pairs of spinal nerves. The cranial nerves all originate in the brain with 10 pairs originating in the brain stem and two pairs originating in the anterior part of the brain. When assessing and documenting activity related to cranial nerves, be sure to use the number rather than the name to avoid confusion. And that table is table 11-1 and that is on page 731 and it gives you the cranial nerves, and this is how I learned the cranial nerves. Um, it, it starts with olfactory, optic, oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal, abducens, facial, facial uh, vestibulocochlear, glossopharyngeal, vagus, spinal, accessory, and hypoglossal. So when I was in nursing school, this is what they told us to remember. On old Olympus, tiny tots, a fin, and German viewed some hops. And that's how I always remember the, the cranial nerves. That's just, just some uh, trivia there for you. The 31 pairs of spinal nerves are named by their location. Eight cervical pairs, 12 thoracic pairs, five lumbar pairs, five sacral pairs, and one pair of coccygeal nerves. All spinal nerves produce motor and sensory activities. Each nerve is responsible for a different segment of the body called a dermatome. Although each spinal nerve root has a specific dermatome distribution, overlap exists between adjacent uh, nerve roots. Reflexes, what are these? They're involuntary, almost instantaneous motor responses to a stimulus. For example, you get burned and you respond. Reflex arcs are neural pathways that allow the sensory neuron to synapse in the spinal cord, which allows the lightning fast result. So that neuron is like firing at, at, the, at the speed of light. The sensory input does reach the brain, but it does not require the brain to process the signal in order to elicit a motor response. A common example is the patellar knee jerk reflex. This is a somatic reflex because it causes skeletal muscle contraction. There's also the autonomic reflexes which cause reaction from smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, or glands. A classic example of an autonomic reflex is the mammalian driving reflex. When cold water contacts the face, it causes bradycardia, peripheral vasoconstriction, and a shift in the blood flow to more central organs. This reflex exists to help humans survive if in the case of drowning. Note that some reflexes are normal in newborns and infants, but can be a sign of PNS or CNF damage if they exist in older children or adults. Examples include the sucking reflex in which infants suck when the area around their mouth is touched, the grasp reflex 
in which infants close their hand around the finger placed in their open palm, then grip the finger tighter when the individual attempts to remove it, and the Babinski reflex in which stroking the outside of the sole of the infant's foot, starting at the heel and going towards the toes, causes the infant's big toe to extend and the other toes to fan out. Alterations to intracranial regulation. This may occur because of illness or injury. Assessment of the pattern of an individual's signs and symptoms will help determine the extent of improvement or deterioration of intracranial regulation. A local brain injury or illness in which only one area is affected will cause a focal neurologic deficit, but should not disrupt the patient's level of consciousness. For example, a brain tumor that is located near the vision center may cause a disruption in sight, but the patient should be fully conscious with no other noted neurological uh, deficits. Consciousness requires both cerebral hemisphere and the RAS to be intact. The cerebral hemisphere are more susceptible to damage and changes in behavior and alterations in levels of consciousness may be early signs of brain dysfunction. If damage to the brain continues, the patient will usually exhibit signs of damage in a fairly predictable stepwise fashion with higher brain functions failing first, decreased consciousness, neurologic dysfunction, and hemodynamic instabilities become apparent as damage progresses within the more primitive parts of the brain, the midbrain and the brain stem. Without successful intervention to stop the progression, death will occur. Manifestations of progressive deterioration of cerebral function are located in Table 11-2, which is on page 732. So you see the levels of consciousness. You're fully conscious. Uh, the patient's responding to verbal stimuli. Uh, the patient requires continuous stimulation to arouse is the next one. Uh, but they have some reflexes. The patient shows no response to any stimulus is the last one. Consciousness is a condition in which the individual is aware of self and environment and is able to respond appropriately to stimuli. Full consciousness requires both normal arousal and full cognition. Is the patient um, alert and oriented to time, person, place, and time? So arousal or alertness depends on the RAS a diffuse system of neurons in the thalamus and upper brainstem. Cognition is a complex process by which an individual learns, stores, retrieves, and uses information. Cognitive processing involves all mental activities controlled by the cerebral hemisphere, including thought processes, memory, perception, communication, problem solving, and emotion. An individual's level of consciousness may be altered by processes that affect the functions of the brainstem, the cognitive function of the cerebral hemisphere, or both. The major causes of altered level of consciousness <clears throat> are lesions, infections, or injuries that affect cerebral hemispheres directly and widely or that compress or destroy the neurons of the RAS. Metabolic disorders or diseases, these may occur outside the nervous system, such as severe heart failure and medications such as psychoactive drugs, toxins, or alcohol consumption. Now you see on this slide, uh, this uh, refers back to your table 11-2, where it's talking about the coma, showing no responses, so make sure you look at table 11-2. So I'm going to move forward. Okay. All right. Note that many of the, these causes involve the disruption or alterations of blood flow to the brain. 
Normal brain function, especially in the cerebral hemisphere, depends on continuous blood flow from unimpeded supplies of oxygen and glucose. Processes that disrupt the flow of blood and nutrients may cause widespread damage, impairing arousal and cognition. Localized masses that displace normal structures and cause direct or indirect pressures on the same or opposite hemisphere or the brainstem also can affect level of consciousness. Consciousness is a dynamic state. A patient may pass from full consciousness to coma within hours or experience a slow diminishment of consciousness that does not become evident for weeks or months. Family members may notice the slow decline outside of a clinical setting and seek evaluation of the patient. The nurse can help provide effective care for a patient with an altered level of consciousness by looking beyond the diagnostic labels of consciousness and accurately assessing the patient's behavior and response to stimuli. <clears throat> the nurse should document assessment findings. Patient is not oriented to place or time. In other words, they would be disoriented to place and time rather than a descriptive uh, label such as patient is disoriented. So they're recommending here the nurse should document assessment findings such as patient is not oriented to place or time. The old way we used to say patients disoriented to place and time, but they recommended that we don't write it that way anymore. <clears throat> On page 733, there are two terms, and uh, these are important terms. Um, look at the figure A and B. It says decorticate posturing is characterized by rigid flexion. It's associated with lesions above the brain stem and the corticospinal tracts and the cerebrate posturing distinguished by rigid extension is associated with lesions of the brainstem. And those are two important terms that you uh, will uh, need to be familiar with. <clears throat> Disorders affecting level of consciousness. Processes occurring in the brain that may directly destroy or, or compress neurologic structures are numerous but include increased intracranial pressure, cerebral infarction, hematomas, hydrocephalus, which is too much fluid on the brain, intracranial hemorrhage, tumors, infections, traumatic brain injury or TBI, concussion, seizure activity and recovery, and demyelinating myelinating disorders such as multiple sclerosis. And that's where the myelin sheath is stripped from the neuron and the uh, neuron is just exposed. And we'll talk about that in, in um, uh, multiple sclerosis. Any systemic condition that affects the delivery of blood, oxygen, and glucose to the brain or that outer cell membranes also may alter level of consciousness. If cerebral blood flow is impaired or the patient becomes hypoxic or hypoglycemic, cerebral metabolism is impaired and level of consciousness often declines rapidly, which is serious. Severe hypoxia quickly leads to ischemia, which is death of the tissue. Ischemia may be focal following a stroke or global from cardiac arrest or hypovolemic shock. Patients at particular risk include those with poorly controlled diabetes and those with cardiac or respiratory uh, failure. <clears throat> Other metabolic alterations that can affect level of consciousness include fluid and electrolyte imbalances and acid-base imbalances. Accumulated waste products and toxins from liver or renal fa failure can affect neuronal and neurotransmitter function, altering level of consciousness. Exposure to things such as hydrocarbons, toxic gases, heavy metals such as lead, may cause either an immediate decrease or slow decline in the level of consciousness or other evidence of neurologic or cognitive impairment. Drugs that depress the central nervous system, such as alcohol, analgesics, and aesthetics, suppress metabolic and membrane activities in the RAS and cerebral hemispheres, which causes uh, uh, affecting the level of consciousness. 
glutamate, the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, may accumulate during prolonged ischemia, resulting in acute glutamate toxicity and death of the cell. As the impairment of the brain function progresses, more stimuli are required to elicit a response from the patient. The patient may initially rouse to verbal stimuli and respond appropriately to questions, remain oriented to time, place, and person. With deterioration of the neurologic function, the patient becomes more difficult to rouse and may become agitated and confused when awakened. Orientation to time is lost initially, followed by orientation to place and then the person. Continuous stimulation or vigorous shaking is required to keep the patient awake as the level of consciousness further decreases. The individual eventually does not respond even to deep painful stimuli, such as like if you were shaking or pinched them or did a sternal rub, they won't eventually won't uh, respond. Increased intracranial pressure. The normal range of ICP is typically 1.5 to 15 of millimeter of, of mercury, but it can vary based on measurement techniques and age. Normal ranges across the lifespan are as follows. Infants 1.5 to 6, children 3 to 7, and adults 5 to 15. Increased intracranial pressure is defined as sustained elevated pressure 15 or higher in adults in the cranial activity. In adults, IICP greater than 20 warrants immediate treatment interventions. Light blood pressure, ICP can be affected by routine activities such as sneezing, coughing, or even something as simple as sitting up. The body's compensatory mechanism control for these minor alterations. However, when ICP rises dramatically or for a sustained period, significant tissue ischemia and damage to delicate neural tissue may result. So the body can compensate for minor alterations is what it's saying. The cranial vault has a fixed size, except in infants whose suture lines remain open, allowing for expansion and only has room for a prescribed amount of blood, 10%, CSF 5%, and brain matter 85%. The relationship among the three components is known as the Munro-Kelly hypothesis. As pressure within the cranial vault increases, CSF is reduced to make room, followed by decreasing blood perfusion, resulting in diminished oxygenation of neurons. Because the neurons in the cerebral cortex are most sensitive to oxygen deficit, changes in cortical function are the earliest manifestations of IICP. You see personality changes as well as impaired memory and judgment. Another set of unique vital signs that the nurse should know and understand related to ICP involves cerebral perfusion pressure or CC, CPP. It depends on the patient's ICP and mean systemic arterial pressure, which is your MAP, and then it gives you the formula there. The normal range for CPP is 50 to 100. It can be reduced by decreasing blood pressure, increasing ICP, or both. If a patient's CPP is too low, it can be raised by increasing the blood pressure and decreasing the ICP or both. Seizures. Seizure activity com commonly affects level of consciousness. Seizure, seizures are periods of abnormal electrical discharges in the brain that may cause involuntary movement and or behavior and sensory alterations. The spontaneous disordered discharge of activity that occurs during a seizure exhausts energy, metabolites, or produces locally toxic molecules which alter the level of consciousness for a time after the seizure. Consciousness returns when the metabolic balance of the neurons is restored. Concussion. A concussion is a minor loss of normal brain function caused by a head injury. It is a common result of sports injuries and falls. Concussions can be difficult to diagnose 
as their symptoms may be minor or may not appear for several days or even weeks after the occurrence. Some symptoms may include confusion, headache, or nausea. Concussion may be accompanied by a loss of consciousness, but this is not required for a concussion to occur. Traumatic brain injury is a result of a violent blow to the head or an object penetrating the skull, such as a bullet or a, a sharp object, such as a knife, that causes brain dysfunction. Symptoms vary according to the severity of the injury and range from mild headache to death. Loss of consciousness may occur in mild, moderate, or severe traumatic injuries. The ability to recover consciousness varies widely based on the severity and location within the brain that the injury occurred. Outcomes of altered level of consciousness. Possible outcomes of altered LOC and calm include full recovery with no long-term residual effects, recovery with residual damage, learning deficits or emotional disabilities, impaired judgment, and more severe consequences such as persistent vegetative state, cerebral death, or brain uh, death. Persistent vegetative state. This is a condition also called irreversible coma. It is a permanent condition of complete unawareness of self and the environment and loss of all cognitive functions usually the result of severe brain trauma or global ischemia. This condition results from death of the cerebral hemisphere with continued function of the brain stem and cerebellum. Although the homeostatic regulatory functions of the brain continue, the ability to respond meaningfully to the environment is lost. The patient is in a vegetative state, has sleep-wake cycles and retains the ability to chew swallow and cough, but cannot interact with the environment. When the person is awake, the eyes may wander back and forth across the room, but they cannot track objects or individuals. In a minimally conscious state, the patient is aware of the environment and can follow simple commands, manipulate objects, gesture or verbalize to indicate yes or no responses, and make meaningful movements such as blinking and smiling in response to a stimulus. With appropriate supportive care, the patient may remain in this state for years. Locked-in syndrome is distinctly different from the vegetative state. The patient is alert and fully aware of the environment and has intact cognitive abilities, but is unable to communicate through speech or movement because of blocked efferent pathways from the brain. Motor paralysis affects all voluntary movements although the upper cranial nerves, one through nine, may remain intact, allowing the patient to communicate through eye movements and blinking. In essence, the patient is locked inside a paralyzed body while remaining fully conscious of self and environment. And that can be difficult for these patients. Infarction or hemorrhage of the pons that disrupts outgoing nerve tracts but spares the RAS is the usual cause of, the, of this syndrome. This condition may also result when the corticospinal tracts between the midbrain and the pons are interrupted. Disorders of the lower motor neurons or muscles, acute uh, polyneuritis, myasthenus gravis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis also may paralyze motor responses leading to locked-in syndrome. And then brain death. It is the cessation and irreversible. It, it, you can't reverse it. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time saying that word. Irreversibility of all the brain functions. So in other words, it's irreversible, including those associated with the brain stem. Although the exact legal criteria for establishing brain death varies somewhat from state to state, Brain death is generally considered to have, a, have occurred when there is no evidence of cerebral or brainstem function for an extended period of time, usually 6 to 24 hours, in a patient who has a normal body temperature and is not affected by a depressant drug or alcohol poisoning. 
generally recognized criteria for brain death are the following. Unresponsive coma with absent motor and reflex movements. No spontaneous respiration, which is apnea. Pupils fixed, unresponsive to light and dilated. Absent ocular responses to head turning and caloric stimulation. Flat electroencephalogram or EEG and no cerebral blood circulation present on angiography. Persistence of these manifestations for 30 minutes to one hour and for six hours after onset of coma and apnea. Apnea in the patient who is comatose is determined by the apnea test. There are no standard protocols and the procedure varies among agencies. However, it is imperative that the patient is monitored closely and continuously for hemodynamic deterioration throughout the procedure. During the apnea test, the, ventil the ventilator is removed for approximately 8 to 10 minutes while oxygenation is maintained by endotracheal or tracheal uh, cannula, allowing the PaCO2 to increase to 60 or higher. This level of carbon dioxide is high enough to stimulate respiration if the brain stem is functioning. EEG may be used to establish the absence of brain activity when brain death is suspected. A flat isoelectric EEG over a period of 6 to 12 hours in a patient who is not hypothermic or under the influence of drug that depress the CNS is generally accepted as an indicator of brain death. So what's the prognosis? The prognosis for patients with outer level consciousness and coma varies according to the underlying cause and the pathologic process. Age and general medical condition also play a role in determining the outcome. Young adults may fully recover following deep coma from head injury, drug overdose, or other causes. Recovery of consciousness within two weeks is associated with a favorable outcome. In general, the prognosis is poor for patients who lack pupillary reaction or reflex eye movement six hours after the onset of the coma. So some specific guidelines here. What is the prevalence? TBIs account for 2.2 million emergency department visits each year. TBIs predominantly affect young people or individuals zero to four years old, older adults age 65 and above, and men or boys. Newborns and infants are especially vulnerable to TBI from shaken baby syndrome or other forms of child abuse. Interpersonal violence also contributes to brain trauma injuries. Falls continues to be the leading cause of TBI in the United States, children and adults. Concussions are often seen in athletes uh, because of the head injuries they have. Collisions involving motor vehicles, bicycles, and pedestrians are also a common cause of injury to the brain. Combat injuries and explosive blasts are common sources of the brain injuries among military personnel due to the, um, the shrapnel and the wounds from the debris that they get from, from the blast. It can be terrible. Genetic factors and risk factors. IICP can be caused by some genetic uh, mutations Hydrocephalus can result from a blockage in the normal flow of CSF, which leads to increased CSF within the ventricular system. The ventricles can dilate somewhat to accommodate the extra fluid, but at a certain point, they no longer compensate and brain damage can occur. Hydrocephalus is a common nervous system congenital anomaly occurring in uh, 0.3 to 2.5 live births. Seizure disorders affect more than 2 million people, although seizures have been identified as causing decreased level of consciousness and many forms of seizures have been identified. Etiologies of seizure disorders have been difficult to pinpoint. Approximately 70 to 80 percent of individuals with epilepsy have a genetic component to disorder, but no single mutation has been found to explain this. Concepts related to intracranial regulation, and this is listed on page 736. You have acid-base balance, 
cognition, mobility, oxygenation, safety, stress, and coping. And so make sure that you read on page 737 and 736 um, about the, um, the different um, things that can occur with intracranial regulation. And the concepts are on page uh, 738. And make sure you read through those. Help promotion. Help promotion related to intracranial regulation generally involves anticipatory guidance related to the individual's age, development, and activities. For example, nurses provide information about protective equipment for outdoor activities and vehicle restraint systems. Help promotion education for older adults includes fall prevention and adhering to cautions that accompany prescription medications. Sometimes older adults take too much medicine or the adverse effects of it cause them to fall. Older adults who are at risk for falls may benefit from a home safety assessment. Patients who have a disorder that affects their balance or mobility should also receive information about fall prevention. Nurses can teach patients at risk for impaired intracranial regulation, the importance of wearing a medical alert bracelet, discussing care plans at school or the workplace, and taking all medications as prescribed. For young children, health promotion may involve wearing a helmet to prevent head injury during a seizure. Health promotion for patients with a history of stroke, seizure disorder, or brain injury also includes patient teaching related to following the treatment regimen. Nurses should review new prescriptions and over-the-counter medications with all patients, making sure to discuss the side effects that affect intracranial regulation. For example, blood thinners may increase the risk of hemorrhage, stroke, and many medications cause drowsiness or require changes in activity level. Nurses should also instruct patients to avoid alcohol which can increase the risk of injury and products that contain nicotine, which increase heart rate and blood pressure and cause vasoconstriction that can increase the patient's risk of stroke. A lot of things and alcohol and smoking has major, major effects on the body. Nursing assessment. So what do we do? A nursing assessment to determine problems with neurologic structure and their function may be conducted during a health screening, may focus on a chief complaint, headaches, or may be part of the total health assessment. Nurses should complete neurologic assessments as early as possible in the assessment process. If the patient has a problem with neurologic structure or function, the nurse should analyze the problem's onset, characteristic, the course, severity, precipitating and relieving factors, and any associated symptoms noting the time and circumstances. If the patient's level of consciousness is altered, the nurse may need to rely on the family members for information. The patient's level of consciousness can be assessed using the Glasgow Coma Scale. So let's look at table 11-3 on 739. So if you have spontaneous opening of your eyes, you get four points. If you have no response, you get one point. Verbal response, if you verbally respond appropriately, you get five points or no response, one point. And so you see it's, it's a point system. The minimum score is three, indicating total neurologic unresponsiveness. Make sure you know the Glasgow Coma Scale. Nursing assessment, observation, and patient interview. So one of the first things that we do with patients is we observe and we conduct the interview. Then the next thing we would do would be the hands-on physical assessment. Nursing assistants can get measurements such as vital signs and height and weight and um, uh, put their belongings away and uh, things of that nature. Um, but, you know, we observe and we interview first, and then the next thing we do is the physical assessment. So what do we observe? Some information about the patient's neurologic status can be gleaned just by careful observation on the part of the nurse. In in and out of hospital settings, no, notice the patient's appearance and dress. Does the patient look well-groomed or disheveled? 
do some patients have who have had a stroke may neglect the side of the body that was affected. That's called neglect syndrome. You'll learn about that when uh, we talk about strokes. Observe how the patient walks and whether the patient requires an assistive device or to help um, uh, or the help of a caregiver to walk. Does the patient make any movements that seem different from normal? During the interview, observe facial movements, speech patterns, alertness, general comprehension of simple instructions as to where to sit or where to fill out forms. Do not draw any conclusions from these observations, but make sure to address any observed deviation from normal, because some people can't read, and it might be a vision problem and not necessarily an a, a intracranial problem. Um, maybe they just need their glasses on or maybe they don't read well. Um, a thorough and accurate neurologic assessment requires the nurse to be attentive. Assessment is a skill that is developed through practice and repetition. Nurses should develop a systematic approach to neurologic assessment to make sure no essential elements are left out. The following general interview questions may be employed as part of the approach. Have you ever been diagnosed with a neurologic illness? If so, when? What was the treatment plan? What helped? What made it worse? What were your medications? And so forth. And there's six questions here. Do you have a history of fainting or seizures? And then they ask details about it. Have you noticed any changes in your vision, hearing, or smelling? Have you noticed a change in your balance and coordination? If they answer yes, then go to the bullet points. Are you having pain? And how do they describe that pain? Have you noticed any changes in your memory? And go ask them the bullet points if they say yes. Then the next thing we do is physical exam, that hands-on, head-to-toe assessment, the physical exam. Some parts of the physical exam portion of a neurological assessment can be done by general observation rather than a formal process. The nurse should document all findings in a clear, concise manner to help other nurses and clinicians quickly note any changes in neurologic status. For example, the nurse should document the patient is alert and oriented to person and place, but not time, rather than the patient is alert and oriented times two. They really want you to spell things out now instead of using any type of abbreviations. They really want us to, um, when we're doing our notes or documenting anything, to actually spell out everything we're doing because it does make it clear. A thorough neurologic examination should ideally include assessment of the patient's cranial nerves, mental status, reflexes, muscle strength, and coordination, and gait. The nurse should note lack of symmetry between sides of the body. A complete neurologic exam is usually not performed in otherwise healthy patients. The physical exam with a neurologic focus is often one of the hardest assessment skills for new nurses to do. Strategies student nurses and new nurses can use to improve their skills in this area include practicing on fellow students and family members and carefully observing focused neurologic assessments conducted by a more experienced clinician. The neurologic exam only becomes efficient and accurate with practice and repetition. Diagnostic tests. You see these listed here. And on page 740 and 741 is the neurologic assessment. And so I would review this. It shows how to assess the mental status and, it'll, and the, the questions to ask for cognitive function, like repeat five to seven numbers, recall three items after five minutes, recall what you have for breakfast or your birthday, Make sure you look over this on 740, and then 741 are your cranial nerves, and it gives you some insight on the normal findings, abnormal findings, and which nerve um, that is affected. Again, neurologic assessment it continues on 742 and 743 with the cranial nerves, and it tells you uh, which nerve is what, like, um, cranial nerve 8 is acoustic, which is hearing, and cranial nerve 12, hypoglossal, is, is uh, your ability to stick out your tongue and move it from side to side. Um, and then on page 744, it's showing you um, uh, 
the uh, graphesthesia test and the two-point discrimination test. And so graphesthesia is like when they write the number and they have to tell you what the number was. And then the two-point discrimination is can you feel the same, um, like they touch you with two, two objects and can you feel both of those. So make sure you review, that's a nice detailed chart uh, there for you. And it goes all the way through page uh, 746. The diagnostic tests are listed here for you and your reading gives a little um, explanation of what some of these are. Um, this picture here is um, thermography. Uh, I, I wanted you to see what that looked like. Uh, here are some other um, diagnostic tests, uh, electrolytes, ICP, uh, monitoring, monitoring that pressure, uh, getting uh, analysis of the cerebrospinal fluid. So you see right here on the picture, they go in between that vertebrae and go actually into the spinal canal to get that. Okay, and then your glucose and antidiuretic hormone. So just review over the diagnostic test. Inter independent interventions. The nurse must be able to recognize a change in the level of consciousness the patient uh, of a patient and provide care immediately. This is uh, any anytime the level of consciousness changes, you need to respond. Okay, something's causing that patient to have altered mental status, and you need to respond. The first step in care is to treat the underlying cause and prevent further, further deterioration. So the first thing you may do is a head-to-toe assessment and then notify the health care provider. Primary interventions include maintaining a patent airway, initiating protocols to treat neurologic issues. The nurse may also need to prepare the patient for surgical intervention. So there's several things, some other specific things. Um, we, uh, the nurse may uh, assess level of consciousness, pupil responses, and neurologic status. Monitor fluid intake and output. We should do that on all our patients. Reducing environmental stimuli. That, that's not a bad idea for all our patients too. Raise the head of the bed 30 degrees to decrease ICP if appropriate, and there are no contraindications such as a neck injury or something. Uh, taking precautions for seizures, including padding side rails, if they still do that. Some places don't do that anymore. Monitoring the CCP and the ICP. Deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis, such as compression stockings or SCDs, um, and administering IV fluids as ordered. Two additional interventions the nurse may perform are assessing for signs of Cushing triad and using hyperventilation to reduce ICP. So what is Cushing triad? Let's look at that. Cushing triad is a set of clinical signs that indicate increasing ICP, bradycardia, irregular respirations, and a widening pulse pressure, increasing systolic blood pressure, and decreasing diastolic blood pressure. That's what widening pulse pressure is. Hyperventilation to decrease ICP requires an intubated patient. The practice was quite common, but has recently been called into question as it can exacerbate cerebral ischemia. It is now only advocated as a short-term, less than 16 hours intervention while waiting until other methods of controlling IICP can be utilized. So they're, they're constantly researching stuff and, uh, you know, by the time you guys get out and practice, some of this stuff may already be changed. Um, collaborative therapies. Patients with altered level consciousness require support of the airways and assistance with respiration. For patients who are drowsy but capable of being aroused, a nasopharyngeal airway may be sufficient. Patients who are not easily aroused may tolerate an oro oropharyngeal airway. More severe alterations in level consciousness, however, require endotracheal intubation to maintain a patent airway particularly if the patient's cough and gag reflexes are uh, absent. If the decrease in level of consciousness is due to a concussion or traumatic brain injury, be sure that the cervical spine is maintained in a neutral position during laryngoscopy, oscopy, 
I'm sorry, you all. Some of these words are hard to pronounce. Laryngoscopy is how you say it. Unless a spinal cord injury has already been ruled out, hypoventilation or apnea indicates the need for mechanical ventilation. Unless the patient has a do not resuscitate order, the healthcare team should initiate mechanical ventilation even if it is not yet known if the disorder is reversible. And now it's not necessarily called a DNR, it's called a AND. Um, so you may see it, uh, uh, do not resuscitate order written as a, a AND. Uh, and different hospitals are using different things now. They don't always use DNR anymore. I just want to bring that out. Um, you may not see that in the hospital. Without sufficient support of ventilation, cerebral anoxia develops quickly and may result in brain death. Monitor arterial blood gases of patients on ventilation frequently to determine the adequacy of ventilation. Cautious hyperventilation, PaCO2 of 30 to 35, may be used to reduce PaCO2 and promote cerebral vasoconstriction to reduce cerebral edema. Safety alerts, and I really think you should look at your safety alerts. Uh, they're very important. Recent research has discouraged routine use of long-term hyperventilation. If done too aggressively, it can cause cerebral ischemia and produce a poor patient outcome. If hyperventilation is used, it should be only a temporary measure until another intervention to reduce IICP can be initiated. Note that hyperventilation has been shown to lose its effectiveness after about 16 hours of continuous use. So pay attention to that. Fluid management, and I got a little ahead of myself. The nurse inserts an IV catheter and maintains a fluid balance using isotonic or slightly hypertonic solutions such as normal saline. And I know uh, these type of solutions was discussed in uh, 112 because I taught 112 this summer and we talked about the fluids um, in depth. Um, so uh, just refer back to your book on, uh, if you need to familiarize yourself with hypo, hyper, and isotonic uh, fluids. Uh, the nurse should avoid hypotonic fluids as they may cause an increase in cerebral edema and decrease serum osmolar osmolarity. The nurse should closely monitor the patient's response to fluid administration for evidence of increased cerebral edema. An underlying fluid and electrolyte imbalance is corrected by administering IV fluid containing appropriate electrolytes. For the patient who is, who is hyponatremic and has a low serum osmolality, ferrosamide lasix or an osmotic diuretic such as mannitol may be administered to promote water excretion and fluid infusion may be minimized. In certain circumstances, a bolus of 3% uh, sodium chloride hypertonic saline may be used. This strategy requires close monitoring of serum sodium and serum osmolarity. Got to be careful with 3%. There are a multitude of surgical procedures that may be appropriate for the patient experiencing alterations in intracranial regulation. These procedures are specific to the underlying cause of the alteration and are covered at length in the exemplars. The nurse should be aware that because intracranial regulation is such a dynamic system, the patient may deteriorate to the point that surgery is required at any time. And here's a picture of um, removing um, the uh, skull and putting in a shunt to uh, relieve some of the pressure. Pharmacological therapy. So what do we do for seizures? Uh, medications are available to reduce and manage seizure activity by raising the seizure threshold or limiting the spread of abnormal activity in the brain. And you can see medications on the seizure exemplar for that. The goals of medication for seizure disorder are to protect the patient from harm and to reduce or prevent seizure activity without impairing cognitive function or producing undesirable effects or side effects. The lowest possible dose of a single medication that will control the patient's seizure should be prescribed. However, several medications must be tried before the most effective one is identified and a combination of drugs may be needed to manage the patient's seizure. Some medications have been found to be more effective in treating certain types of seizures than others.
Status epilepticus requires immediate intervention to preserve life. Establishing and maintaining the airway are priorities. A solution of 50% dextrose is administered IV to prevent hypoglycemia. Diazepam or lorazepam is given IV as a first-line agent. Fentoyin or phosphofentoyin may be administered IV to control seizures for a longer period. Phenobarbital or pentobarbital also may be administered to patients with status epilepticus. On rare occasions in which none of these drugs stop the seizure activity, general anesthesia using IV propofol may be uh, used. And these are with your severe uh, seizures. Pharmacological therapies for increased intracranial pressure. Medications play an important role in the management of IICP. Diuretics, particularly osmotic diuretics, are commonly used to reduce ICP and the mainstays of pharmacological treatment. Loop diuretics, such as furosemide, may be prescribed for some patients with IICP. Sedation and paralysis are used as chemical restraints to control restlessness and agitation because these movements increase, increase blood pressure, ICP, and cerebral metabolism. Antipyretics, such as acetaminophen, are used alone or in combination with hypothermia blanket to treat hyperthermia. Hyperthermia increases the cerebral metabolic rate and exacerbates an existing increase in ICP. Anti-seizure drugs are often required to manage seizure activity associated with brain injury and IICP. Gastrointestinal prophylaxis with IV histamine H2 antagonists or proton pump inhibitors is often used because patients with IICP are at increased risk for developing stress, gastritis, and ulcers. Corticosteroids are no longer recommended for routine use in decreasing IICP. ICP, ICP and have been shown to increase mortality rates. IV fluids, usually necessary to maintain the patient's fluid and electrolyte balance as well as vascular volume. If the patient's blood pressure is unstable, vasoactive medications may be administered but maintain the uh, mean arterial pressure or MAP in a range that supports cerebral perfusion while maintaining increased ICP. you got to have that cerebral uh, perfusion. Um, traumatic brain uh, injury and concussion, uh, read that little section on your own because I've talked a little bit about that, but it does have some medicine, uh, uh, but I didn't have it on the slide. So make sure you read that on your own on page 748. Non-pharmacological and I'm sorry I hit the button too fast and it won't let me go back. The patient with alteration in intracranial regulation may have many needs based on the severity of the insult. Respiratory therapy will probably be required. If a patient is on a ventilator, the respiratory therapist will assist with, ventil with ventilator weaning, ensure adequate oxygenation and ventilation, and maintain a patent airway with endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube care and suctioning. Pulmonary hygiene is important, but it requires a delicate balance between activities that may cause IICP, such as coughing, and prevention of atelectasis, which is collapsed lung, and pneumonia, such as incentive spirometer. Most patients will need the assistance of physical therapy. The unconscious patient will require passive range of motion, Patients who have sustained paralysis due to intracranial processes will need physical therapy beginning early in their hospital admission and continuing after discharge. Specialized physical therapy, such as vestibular rehabilitation, may be required based on the site and the extent of the neurological disruption. Occupational therapists may be helpful for patients who require assistance with more fine motor skills. Speech therapy helps them uh, learn how to talk again and assist with feeding or swallowing. Of all the systems, the most damage and require the most support of the patient and the family and after the event. Um, and then that is an insult to the neurologic system. Many patients will experience permanent alterations in their lifestyle after an illness or injury affects their intracranial regulation. These may require or benefit from the support of clergy, 
members, social workers, mental health specialists, and support groups. Now, uh, nutritional um, uh, management, and it talks about the vegetative state and the locked-in syndrome, and we've already talked about that, so make sure you just um, go back and know that. All right, so lifespan considerations. Uh, intracranial regulation in infants. Neonates, they have that primitive reflexes we talked about. It arises in the spinal cord, but it does not require interpretation uh, by the brain. So at birth, babies have what are known as primitive reflexes. These reflexes arise in the spinal cord, but not require the interpretation by the brain because they're coming from the spinal cord. Several of the common primitive reflexes present at birth are the stepping reflex, the startle reflex, the sucking reflex, and the Babinski reflex. Table 33-16 in the exemplar on newborns, you can see that there. Throughout the first six months of life, many of the primitive reflexes disappear, although the Babinski reflex is normal in children through age two. When assessing a newborn, the nurse should measure the head circumference and assess the anterior and posterior font nails. Both font nails are open at birth to accommodate the infant's head passing through the birth canal and then to accommodate uh, ongoing brain growth and development. If intracranial edema or bleeding occur, the open font nails also help accommodate expansion in the cranium. The anterior font nail may re remains open for a year the posterior closes at about two months. An abnormally large head circumference with font nails that are spread apart is an indicator of IICP, which warrants immediate intervention. Other signs of IICP in infants are bulging font nails, a shrill cat-like cry, or a weak or absent cry, irritability and lethargy, and loss of previously acquired motor skills. In healthy infants, IICP often results from child abuse, especially shaken baby syndrome. Other causes in infants is congenital hydrocephalus, in which CSF builds up in the brain. And hydrocephalus can be caused by genetic uh, abnormalities and developmental disorders, among other causes. For conditions such as hydrocephalus in which fluid accumulates in the brain, the most common treatment is insertion of a shunt to drain the fluid. In children, causes of IICP are similar in children as in other groups, including trauma, infection, tumors, certain medications, or endocrine disorders. The condition may also be idiopathic. The signs that we see are changes in behavior, difficulty walking, nausea, vomiting, stiff neck, uncoordinated movements, and changes in the eyes, such as droopy eyelids, crossed eyes, and vision changes. When beginning a neurologic assessment on a child, the nurse should consider the child's developmental age, similar, uh, simple interview questions, and a shorter assessment may be necessary. When assessing children for neurologic deficits, the nurse should keep the following points in mind. And you have like eight bullet points. Uh, these are listed on uh, page 750. And because this uh, PowerPoint's already over an hour, uh, we're going to recommend that you read that on your own. And then uh, ICP in women, uh, there is a paragraph on page 750. Uh, please read over that as well because I'm, I don't want this PowerPoint to be uh, much longer. And then you have um, lifespan considerations in the older adult, and you have about 10 bullet points on page 750 as well. And please refer to page 750 uh, for these uh, bullet points because, again, this PowerPoint's getting uh, really long. And here... Uh, on uh, your last slides here are your bullet points uh, listed for um, uh, when you're interviewing these adults and the questions and the things to look at. And we've already talked about some of those as well. So please refer to um, page 750 and uh, review that uh, as you get to these slides. 
The most common cause of IICP in older adults is falls, but these patients also experience alterations in ICP due to motor vehicle accidents, infections, and other illnesses. Treatment for the older adult with an alteration in intracranial regulation is similar to that for young adults. With more serious alterations resulting from injuries and illnesses, the nurse should check to see whether the patient has a durable power of attorney for health care or a living will. Many older adults wish to have every medical and surgical intervention, whereas others prefer no um, heroic efforts. Check with the patient and the family and have an honest, open dialogue about resuscitation status and efforts and reasonable expectations. Thank you.